Well, good morning, church. Good morning. Oh, y'all need to wake up this morning. Let's try it one more time. Good morning, church. Good morning. There you go. Colt, I can always expect you to say good morning, brother. Oh, what a joy. A couple announcements I want to give to you, but before we do that, Miss Marcia, would you come and share about our craft and chat and what we're going to be doing next Saturday? Next, next Saturday at 11, from 11 to 1, we are going to be making burrito pillowcases. And they're not edible. And but they're not edible. <laughs> we will take, it will start like this, and then it will turn into this. And after we get them made, if you want, we are going to start doing a collection to take to South Texas Children's Home. So if you want to make your pillowcase, and donate it, and it will go to a good cause. So I hope to see you Saturday. And if you don't have a sewing machine, come anyway because we're going to have extras. All right, that'll be this Saturday, 10 o'clock, is that correct? 11 o'clock? All right, and now knowing this group, there'll probably be snacks. Uh, I'm just saying, I'm just saying. Uh, but they'll, they'll have a good time. Uh, Road Runners, Italian cuisine is your uh, menu. menu for Tuesday for game day. We'll do that up here at the church. Also, um, don't forget uh, Bible study. Uh, gosh, all during the week, check it out. It's on there. I'm going to mess them up. I know Monday there'll be a ladies' Bible study in the parlor. Tuesday there'll be a Bible study at 9 is at 8.30, choir practice at 6. Ladies Bible study in the evening. Um, Wednesday night at Iwana, we, we, we kick it off or continue to kick it off. It's been a good, good semester. Uh, this Wednesday is going to be a little bit different. I do want to let you know Don Griffin passed away. If you do not know, Don Griffin passed away day before yesterday or Friday, Saturday, somewhere right in there. Um, wasn't doing well, just uh, went kind of downhill over the last couple weeks. Uh, Wednesday, we're going to, there'll be a private funeral with family and close friends in Share Family Cemetery over in Poteet. Is that Share or Share? Share uh, in Poteet. And then at 2 o'clock here on Wednesday, There'll be a reception uh, with Virginia will be here and Don, uh, Donnie and the family will be here. Uh, be cake, coffee. So we need your help. Uh, we need some um, desserts, cookies, cakes, things like that that can be used. And then Virginia will be here too till about 3.30, 4 o'clock uh, for y'all have an opportunity in case you can't uh, get over there. Any other announcements that I'm missing? Yeah, Cody has an announcement. <laughs> well, I just want to tell you, he didn't miss the target yesterday. <laughs> we had a gender reveal. And uh, do you want to share? Or do you want to? I can do it. Listen, this is my only grandchild. I know I'm fighting. I know I'm fighting against some others, but uh, they're going to have a little baby boy. <laughs> Amen. And we're excited about that, and I, I say that I'm really, they're not mine, I, I just, but you get the idea on it. Um, am I missing any announced business meeting will be next Wednesday night, or next Sunday night. Uh, we'll do Lord's Supper next Sunday morning. We have baptism next Sunday morning as well, so I want to remind you of that. Be a fun Sunday. Uh, some of you have come as our guests this morning, and we want to take this opportunity and recognize you. Located inside your bulletin is an information card. If you'll take that information card, tear it out, fill it out, drop it off in the offering plate as it comes by. We'd love to have a record of your visit. We're not going to make you stand up or anything like that and shout and say hey or anything like that. But what I do want you to do is with our church members to stand and meet some of the finest people in the world. So church family and guests, let's stand together and let's meet one another. All right, as we make our way back to our seats, I'll apologize right off. The Urbans are out of town, so you got stuck with me again this morning. Uh, we're going to start our 
Thing with all hail King Jesus, number 295. And we're going to go straight from that into 297 Majesty. No break. Just keep rolling. <laughs> pray together. Father, we love you and we thank you for this day you've given us. And Lord, we thank you that we can come into your house to sing praises about your name, to lift your name up. God, because of your majesty, because of who you are, Lord, we thank you for that. Thank you for these people. Thank you for this church, this community. And God, I pray that we would be the people you've called us to be. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We have a seat. And let's all turn to number 314. All hail the power of Jesus' name.
for our offertory let's stand it is well with my soul number 447 <coughs> Our dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the opportunity to be in your house and worship without trials and tribulations. And dear Lord, even in this land, in this world of unfaithfulness, help us to remember that you're faithful. And dear Lord, that you're still in control. Dear Lord, we ask that you be with Brother Brian as he brings a message. Be with Cody as he leads our youth. Dear Lord, we just ask you to be with us as we go through this week and help us make godly decisions. Dear Lord, take this offering, use it to further that service. These things we ask in your name. Amen. Well, 
the CD for the song I was going to sing didn't get here to me in time. So there's an older hymn that we've even in this church sang quite a bit, but it's always going around in my head and my heart. I believe it's page 256 in the hymnal. And as it would be, I woke up with congestion this morning. So if you see me gripping the podium, it's because I'm getting dizzy from the air. But if y'all want to turn to this in the hymnal, it's beautiful. The words say everything that we're here for this morning. So anyway, have you been to Calvary? I hope you have. Have you been to the cross where the Lord Jesus suffered? Have you been to Calvary? Have you been to the place of redemption for sinners? Have you been to Calvary? It was there on Calvary. God's dear Son lay down His life for you. While there's time, don't delay. Place your faith in Christ Jesus. Turn your eyes now to Calvary. You can search, you can buy, and try everything man made, but it cannot satisfy. It is Christ, only Christ, who gives life more abundant, and he calls from Calvary. It was there on Calvary, God's dear Son. Thank you, Mary Ruth. I do say, had a want to say thank you to our ladies and uh, men who helped last week get the uh, first responders on track. Uh, the dinner, anyway, not not get them on track. They're probably far better off than we are. Uh, but uh, uh, thank you for that. We had a good good turnout and good folks, good food, good fellowship. And then last night, I had an opportunity for the first time ever to hear. 
swing music, <laughs> gospel swing or Christian swing. I don't know if you can say that in the same breath in a Baptist church or not. But uh, we didn't dance, so that'd be good. Some of them probably wanted to, but had a good time with some of our adults last night. And uh, good again, good food and fellowship. If you got your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 17. One of the things, historically, one of the chief virtues taught by ancient educators was courage. Was courage. It was one of the primary objectives of, of education. But in our modern system, you don't hear a lot about it because we probably don't think we face it the same way that our forefathers, and, and when I say forefathers, I'm talking about way back then, faced it. I mean, I don't know that many of us have faced lions in the streets. Not many of us have lost our lives because of a cold winter, especially in South Texas. Or locust plagues or any other kind of plague for that matter. We don't live in that kind of world anymore. I found that our fears are different, but they're just as real. It's maybe a more deeper, persistent fear. See, I, I grew up around the Cold War. Some people say it was like living with an invisible gun held to your head and some Russian finger on the trigger. I, I don't know about that. It wasn't that threatening uh, to us, but growing up, that was a fear that teenagers had. Today, it's terrorism. The persistent possibility of what could go wrong. And then there's things like layoffs, doctor's reports, mom and dad, and how many of you have watched your kids like a hawk and you analyze every twitch in their eye, every bump on their body, and how many of you have lost sleep because of something that you've read or come across? And then there's the unknown. Some of you are gripped with fear because of what maybe your spouse might be doing. You have no evidence. You have no reason to doubt, but for whatever reason, you do. And some of us, it may be opinions. You live your life in fear because you're afraid of what others might think. This morning's message is about finding the courage to overcome fear. It's really from a classic text, David and Goliath. And if ever there was a text in Scripture that's been misinterpreted, even been misappointed or misunderstood, it's this passage of Scripture. It's the text that if you've coached any sport, you pulled it out for your little league team to help them play against the champs. You're playing against those kids who should be little league, but they're driving to school with peach fuzz on their face. And then you're going to talk about David and Goliath. Well, what I'm going to show you is how to use it in a correct sense. We first come across the word, and we'll be in 1 Samuel 17. God had made a covenant with Abraham. Made a covenant to give him a land and to bless the whole world through his offspring. And the text called it his seed. Not seeds in plural form, but one particular seed. And Abraham divided the animals and God passed through the torn pieces as if to say, may God Himself be torn to peace if He doesn't remain true to His covenant. Abraham's role in the covenant was to wear the sign of circumcision on himself and all of his sons. Every verse that follows has the echoes of the covenant. 
As a matter of fact, it's virtually impossible to make sense of the Old Testament apart from the a grasp of God's covenant with Abraham. But the first thing is, what is a covenant? A covenant is an agreement. And sometimes covenants may require action on the receiver's part. I will give you this if. If you're in the banking business, you, you have banks full of covenants. People want to borrow money and they'll do it if they'll repay it. There's requirements usually that's there. But here, we had a, what originally was a theocratic system of government. A theocratic system of government is where the priest uh, rule or it's the form of government. God appoints a, 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 a priest. That's where you get theo and theocratic system of government. And when you think about that and you look at the land that God had promised them, and you look at the time of judges, it spans some 400 years, they had a covenant promise and they had a law. And the Levitical priests were given the duty to ensure that the people were keeping God's law appropriately. And the people, however, decided and desired a king like other nations. So, so they're rejecting this theocratic system of government for, you guessed it, a monarchy. Monarchy is one that has a royal family, a king or a queen that's in charge. And God tells Samuel to give them a king and He gives them Saul. And Saul was supposed to work very closely with the Levites and, and administer the law of God. And Saul thought he was above the Word of God and he chose to do things his own way. Sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? And God says, I'll now find a king that's after my own heart. That is, a king who will value my word above his and my name above his own. And God gave them David, the son of Jesse, the grandson of Ruth, who you're familiar with. Amazing story how God led Saul to Samuel. But as often is the case, there is that period of time that passes between David's anointing by Samuel and actually uh, David actually taking the throne. The story of David and Goliath happens during that time period. This was a day that David made one of the most important leadership decisions of his entire life. It was literally an act of courage that will propel David from the or to the ranks of leadership in the armies of Israel. It is one act of courage that would place David by marriage into the royal family. It is this one act of courage that would cause his heart to be knit together with his best friend Jonathan. It is this one act of courage that would create a cult following for David where the woman would begin, the women would begin to sing, Saul has his thousands, but David has his tens of thousands. And it would be an act of courage that would strategically place him in the minds of the people so that the time he was 30 years of age, he would be seated on the throne. 1 Samuel 17. And I'll work through it. Philistines gathered their armies for battle. And they were gathered at Soko, which belongs to Judah. And why, why did it belong to Judah? Because God said it did. God decreed it so. Verse 2, And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered and encamped in the valley of Elah and drew up the line of battle against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on the mountain on one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side with the valley in between. And there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath whose height was six cubic and a span. Now, there's some disagreement on that. Some people say he's six feet nine. But if you look at it, most theologians will tell you, and historians will tell you, it puts him about nine feet, nine inches tall. Uh, six feet nine, nine feet nine. When you're six feet, doesn't really matter. 
Oh, wait a minute. David was shorter than that. Now, I'm about, what, Wilson, two feet off the stage, off the floor from down here? A little over that. A little over two feet down, and I'm about six feet, seven, eight. So add another foot to Goliath. That's a big boy. That's a big man. You better pack a lunch. If you're going to fight him, and all these things are there, so he's intimidating visually. He's intimidating. The description of his armor isn't only showing his massive size, but it was communicating that he had the best and the cutting edge of military technology in that time period. His armor weighed in excess of 250 pounds alone. Now, I've carried a 25-pound pa uh, bag of dog food through Walmart sometimes. And by the time I get to the counter, I'm flat wore out. That's just 25-pound bags, and I can put it over my shoulder. The thought of having to put five of those bags on my shoulder... This was what they were up against. The armor was made of bronze and the sun hit it. It shined into the eyes of the Israelites and it blinded them. Goliath was naturally an intimidation incarnate. He was, he was intimidating from the get-go. He stood in verse 8, He stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and are you not servants of Saul? Choose for yourselves a man and let him come down to me. If he's able to fight with me and kill me, then we'll be your servants. But if I prevail and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. This was a common approach in the time. Choose a man to fight. The man was going to fight on behalf of everybody. If the man wins, the entire army will be treated as though they've won. If the man loses, the entire army will be enslaved. But whatever this one man does will be imputed on the whole. And if the warrior is courageous, the entire army will be treated as though they were courageous themselves. But if the warrior is a coward, the entire army will be treated as though they were cowards. To lay blame or responsibility You've seen in there a word called imputed. David, who happened to be home tending the sheep, his father's sheep. Jesse, David's father, sends David on an errand to deliver bread and cheese to his brothers who was at the battle. Basically, when David arrives, he hears Goliath taunting the army of Israel. In verse 26, David said to the men who stood by him, What shall be done for the man who kills the Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is the uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Now I want you to hear something. Verse 26, something important. You see where David's mind goes? It goes all the way back to the covenant. Hear me. Hear me. David says, wait a minute. That giant has no covenant right to this land. And this text has been a source of countless halftime locker room talks. It's been given for the positive thinking approach. Parents point to this text and say, listen, you can be anything you set your mind to if you just have the courage. They've even said things like, see, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. But I want you to see something just a little bit different, church. There's more to it than this. God said one thing. Goliath said another. David is taking God's side. You think about covenants that you make. As a father. As a husband. I've made a covenant with my wife. What's that mean? That means I, I have been imputed the right and the power to defend that relationship at whatever cost, whatever it takes. God honors marriage. And He said, you've been given this responsibility. 
responsibility. All throughout Scripture, you see it. So many times, church, we get all bent out of shape and we start fighting for the wrong reason. But David's taking God's side. Why? Because the battle isn't David against Goliath, church. <laughs> it's not against Goliath. It's Jehovah. It's the covenant keeping God of Israel. That's who's fixing to fight Goliath. Do you get it? In your covenants, in your marriage, God so wants your marriage to honor God that He's asked you to make that covenant and He will go before you and He will fight for you. But as with the covenant, there's a requirement that we have to do our part. And that's where we mess up sometimes. Look around this room. Look at all the husbands. It's messed up. Don't be elbowing. He knows it. He knows he messed up. Look at all the wives who's messed up. In that covenant. In that relationship. Listen, it's not necessarily a Little League speech. But it's one more important in the Little League. It's talking about the family and it's talking about the church. Because how your family goes is how the church goes. Hear me on that. You can't have a strong church and weak families. You can't have them. you got to have strong families. And then you have strong churches. Now, verse 32, David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with the Philistines. And Saul said to David, You're not able to go against the Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth, and he is a man of war. And David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep sheep for his father, and when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him, struck him, and delivered him out of his mouth. And it arose against me. I, I caught him by his beard, and I struck him, and I killed him. You see, for David, it was simple, church. Those lambs belong to my father. And God empowered me to protect my father's property. Who do you think you are taking my father's lamb? That was David's approach. The lamb belongs to my heavenly father. Who do you think you are taking my father's land? Verse 36 says, Your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and is uncircumcised outside the covenant Philistines, shall be like one of them. For he has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of the Philistines. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. And then verse 38, Saul clothed David with his armor, and he put a helmet of bronze on his head and clothed him with a coat of ma a mail. Verse 39, David strapped his sword over his armor, and he tried in vain to go, for he had not tested them. Then David said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not tested them. So David put them off. He took them off. And then he took his staff in his hand and he chose five smooth stones from the brook and he put them in his shepherd's pouch. His sling was in his hand and he approached the Philistine. And the Philistine moved forward and came near to David with his shield bearer in front of him. And when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him for he was but a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. And the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the fields. And then go down to verse 45. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with the sword and with the spear and with the javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the army of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and I will cut off your head. 
And I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines today to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's and He will give you into our hand. And in verse 48, when the Philistines arose and came and drew near to David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag, he took out this stone, he slung it, and he struck the Philistine in his forehead right smack dab in the middle. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the ground and David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone. And he struck the Philistine and he killed him. So where does courage come from, church? Amen. First of all, it comes from our past. Think about that. David had a mental resume. David had a mental resume for the faithfulness of God. Oh, young people, you ever wonder why sometimes our senior adults don't get bent out of shape, don't get too worked over things? They tend to be calm amidst the storm. They lose a loved one. They lose a child. They lose a spouse. They lose these things. And you sit there and you say these terms, I don't know how they make it. Because they've got a mental resume of what God's done in the past. He promises if we keep that covenant, He'll honor it with us and He'll watch over and He'll protect us. He's got an unlimited supply of God's faithfulness. You think about that, what God's done before. That single greatest encouragement for you to trust God today is to look how God has faithfully done it and obeyed and done what He said He would do in times past. That's how we see it. We don't do it to build an audience. Some of you ought to be journaling. Some of you ought to be writing down. No, all of us ought to be writing down journaling what God's done. It's His faithfulness. It's going to bring you through it. You need to tell God's stories of faithfulness to your kids, to your grandkids, to your great-grandkids, to your nieces, to your nephews, to your children, to your friends, to your relatives, to your neighbors. You need to tell about God's faithfulness to your one. Remember your one? Have you forgot about it? Who's your one? About God's faithfulness. Second thing, you need to operate in particular strengths. Now, I know that sounds crazy, but Saul's army and weaponry was really out of this world. He tried to transfer it to David, but David fought battle in Saul's strength and it wouldn't work. It would have gone completely different. And listen to me, and I want you to hear this. You can't get to heaven when your grandma, your mother, your grandfather, your grandpa's relationship with Christ. It's a choice you make. Okay? It's a choice you make. They can take you to church. They can drag you to church kicking and screaming, but ultimately, it has to be your decision. It's your decision. That's why David couldn't use Saul's weaponry. It wouldn't have worked. What happens when we use what God's given us? You see, what was at stake here was God's reputation. How do you know that? Well, have you read Exodus? Have you read Joshua? Have you read Judges? In all those books, God was building a name, a reputation. And in all those, He was faithful to His covenant people. The key to courage is not worrying about your name or what other people may think, not worrying about your reputation or to operate in, in, in your own power and strength. No, the object is you operate in God's name and God's reputation. 
That means that you'll operate with integrity. You'll trust God for the results. That means that you won't cut corners. Why? Because God's a God of excellence. And that means that you'll give God your best. Why? Because He's worthy. And that's why we can sing songs like, It is well with my soul. Because of that faithfulness that you've seen in the past with God. And He'll do it again. But then you've got to look at God's agenda. David never saw his own success as importance. He saw himself as part of a much bigger plan. I can encourage you to take the time to orient yourself with God's agenda. What is God's agenda? Taking people who are far from Him and bringing them into a relationship with Him. Making them disciples. So when you enter that workforce, is it your agenda that's on your mind or is it God's agenda that's on your mind? When you enter that business meeting or that council meeting, is it your reputation or is it God's reputation that matters the most? And you need to get with the mindset that wherever you see a threat, know that God sees a mission field. He sees an opportunity. And if you can see that, then you will begin to erase the fear that you have welled up in your own mind. So we live out God's agenda. Fourth thing, we, can, we, we get concerned about God's reputation. Over and over again, David says, I come to you in the name of the Lord. And when you see that in the Bible, it doesn't mean the actual name Jehovah or Yahweh or Jesus. It will, when we're praying over our food, we say in Jesus' name. It isn't because we think that that little bit of magic is associated with saying that. No, here's what it means, that the name equals reputation. So when David says, I come in the name of the Lord, he's saying that I fight in God's reputation. What was God's reputation? Well, again, you go to Exodus, you go to Judges, you go to Joshua, and all those books, God again was building a reputation for him. He was faithful to His covenant people. And the courage is to not worry so much about your name and reputation, but honor and worry and lift up God's name and His reputation. That means that you will again operate with integrity. That means that you won't cut corners. That means that you're going to give it your best. That means that God's faithful. There's a final thing. <coughs> Most of the sermons that I've heard on this text say, now go and be like David. But remember, anytime we see a hero in the Bible, we, we need to remember that we are to remember that he is a type, a shadow of a greater hero. Hebrews chapter 12 tells us to look at David and remember his faith and trust God, and that's good. But it also tells us to set our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before Him endured the cross. When you read this story, when you're going through what you're going through right now, whatever that may be, don't always put yourself in the place of David. Put your place in the thousand soldiers that were trembling on the sidelines. Because one greater than David battled one greater than Goliath. Do you hear that? It was a much deeper battle than just David and Goliath. Do you hear me? It's always a deeper battle than just David and Goliath. Jesus, like David, fought and He defeated Satan. He de defeated sin. He defeated judgment. He defeated hell. And like David, He fought not just for us, but in place of us. And that's that word, 
imputed to you. What Jesus accomplished, hear me, what Jesus accomplished when He overcame the grave, when He overcame death, He imputed to you. Hear me. It's as if you accomplished it. It's as if you fought it and won. That's what imputed means. He's transferred it to you. Why? For me, He made a covenant with me. He says He'll forgive me of my sins. What do I have to do? I have to confess my sins and ask for that forgiveness. That's that requirement. And God made a covenant with me. He imputed eternal life onto me. It's as if I fought and won the battle. When fear grips you, look to David. Look to Jesus and ask yourself, what can my Goliath do to me? in light of what Christ has already done. Can you knock me down? Listen to me. Get back up. Get back up. Can you embarrass me? It's not about me. It's about God. Can you defeat me? I may be temporarily defeated, but the mission of Christ will be accomplished ultimately, and that's what all matters. Knock me down. I'm going to get up. Because he loves me that much. Then David ran and stood over the Philistine. Did you get that? Verse 51. David ran and he stood over the Philistine and he took his sword and he drew it out and he killed him and he cut off his head. I know it's graphic. You didn't think it was going to be a little R rated this morning. He cut off his head, and when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they, what'd they do? Fled. They ran. And the men of Israel and Judah rose with a shout and pursued the Philistine as far as Gath at the gates of Ekron. They looked at David, and they found courage. But ultimately, it was Christ who gave it to him. You see, church, that's what makes the difference. That's what makes the difference when we talk about our one that we're connected to. That's what fear, that's what makes us want to give up on our one. God's looks at me and he said, Brian, you didn't pick your one, I did. That's a whole new different ballgame. Fear? Fear's real. It happens. But I know God's resume. I know what he's done in the past. He will do it again. What's my part? That's between you and the Lord. That's between you and the Lord. It's not any of my business. Well, you may choose to share it. That's fine. But really the business is what are you going to do to overcome that? Because the choice is yours. Let's pray together.